<sighs> All right, let's begin. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Mr. Within's Gift channel. I want to speak about uh, today's episode, which is a passenger on hidden trains of thought. And I'm going to explain to you what I mean by that. You see, I am wondering about the presence of human psychology. I am wondering about human life and if all of humanity, if our species could gather around and in some sense figure out exactly what is going on, what patterns would it recognize? What would it consider to be valuable? The first thing we notice is our existence. Our existence is static. Then we notice our experience, which is, through di which is dynamic and through a sort of journey or mode of being. You see, we externally travel. Imagine you got on a train, went to a different town, different place. Similarly, we're trying to wonder if the mind can navigate. <clears throat> if the mind can, in some sense, bring about thoughts that if your attention goes on to, that thought can direct you. That thought can literally, like a subway booth or a train, move you. And so this is what humanity has not realized, the animative force of the creative mind. Sorry guys, I'm feeling a bit nasally. I gotta take these in, uh, intermissions in the middle of it. If you were a passenger, on a thought, what would that experience be? Well, we see that thoughts come from what our sensory perception provides. In some sense, thought is light. And so when Albert Einstein was in that post office thinking up of the theory of relativity, moving, trying to visualize and conceive through a thought experiment uh, of how far this man could move as the image of light. And regardless of his findings of... Uh, Special relativity. It was as if in that moment the mind was more animated and exciting than the body. So as if a non-physical phenomena became more engaging. A subjective movement took Albert Einstein in his mind towards moving at the speed of light. <clears throat> and so if we are wondering about how we are passengers on thoughts, well, we can look at our conditioning.
Okay, I'm stalling here. Let's get to it. I am pretty much seeing objective phenomena move. I am asking myself, how can subjective phenomena move? When I wonder about how subjective phenomena moves, it becomes a more of a multidimensional view. It becomes as if an aspect of your intelligence is witnessing phenomena. It is the observer of the moment. And an aspect of your intelligence is the object and the subjects of the moment. And with every word comes a world. And so in some sense, the moment is a phenomena of world generation, is it not? We are generating worlds. We're constantly having our values changed in accordance to the outcomes of our experiences. <clears throat> we cannot say we are pure existential creatures because we don't feel like atoms, even though we consider we are made of it and even though we consider 99.9% .9 of the atom is empty, you know? I don't know how to tell you, but uh, I have experienced uh, the subjective realm and its acceleration. <clears throat> so what I mean is I've kind of experienced the evolution of imagination to some degree, what we can do with it. You see, through language, we separate ourselves from our mind. If they say what is separating man and the gods, the veil of thought is language. Because any thought must have shape, and any shape must be acknowledged. So here's a kind of personal example of how I felt there was a moment where I felt I could travel on my thoughts, as if my, th if my thoughts were a hidden train, I could follow it through a sort of pattern of design that it's as if you go for a sort of ride. So what does that mean? You see, there's a certain uh, degree of your perception and your articulation of the world around you that has to do with pa the past and how you keep the past to yourself <clears throat> in relation to yourself in the present moment. And then there's a notion of imagination. So Mr. Within is kind of telling you, when you become curious about what imagination and memory are, you will undeniably uh, realize a sort of experiential difference, okay? As if in one, one view of life, you are the movement of the cosmos. In another view of life, you are, you know, just good old you, you know? So, so it's one <laughs> <coughs> or little small you. It's, it, it's, it's either we're, we feel we are the world or we feel we are the self in the world. The mind is oscillating between this. So, the mind, at first, most people want to use it. You know, it's like if somebody asks you, hey, man, why do you want your mind?
your mind is a door to the unknown. It is nature's door. We, d we seem to forget that regardless of the technology man builds, the technology exists in the eye of the user. Your life has to be, has to, you have to live for something, which means there must be a sort of direction that your free will gives to this energetic expression you are. Now, here comes the idea. Some people are under the impression that you only live once, so just stay in the present moment. Don't think about anything. Don't hold any responsibility. Just in some sense, be a pilgrim in manifestation as long as you're here. That is one manner. That is, I, I've seen many people do this. But another manner is to realize that the concept of an opportunity is our hope. It's as if hope can never be seen. But it can be considered. A mentality upon life where it's all or nothing. Our psychologies play around with phenomena like this. We either attribute everything to something or we attribute nothing to anything, you know. One can say that <clears throat> the fundamental purpose of the existential creature is to devour, to survive. There is a frenzy going on for continuity, as if there is this line called survival of the species, and the human species has bud to the top of the line. And so we have become the most advanced uh, species on this planet to the degree that we created a world beyond the comprehension of many creatures on this planet. <clears throat> what that means is in some sense humanity has made its own hidden train station in nature. We have made, we have opened our own paradise, a paradise that for example cats and dogs and pets may get, uh, can get close to but they can never comprehend. For example, you see a parrot. A parrot is a smart animal. It can repeat certain sounds. <clears throat> and a parrot that repeats the certain sound can in some sense comprehend the phenomena but cannot comprehend the meaning of the phenomena or the implied meaning of the phenomena. And to be honest, a lot of knowledge has to do with th filtering through the implied meaning of reality. You have to step out of your own eyes first. This is a strange concept, but it's like before you find the eyes of God, you must step out of your own eyes. St. Augustine, uh, <coughs> I believe it was St. Augustine, he said something very interesting. He said, uh, you must die, it is in dying to self that we are born to eternal life. He was, uh, of course, a priest, you know, holding the banner of Christianity. But the idea was, 
How can I tell you? You are identifying as an individual objective and uh, objective creature, you know, conscious individual objective creature. Consider these three dimensions. <clears throat> now let's go through them. I say individual because you're right now an individual. We personify things. We don't even personify the world as, uh, as, as we don't even personify the source of the universe as God. We personify ourselves. Everything is being turned uh, in regard to, is being centered in accordance to human values. You know, because our intelligence is superior, our superiority is becoming the defining factor of the culture. <clears throat> uh, sorry, not the culture, the planet, the ecosystems of the planet. All right, guys, the second dimension, <laughs> the second dimension. So think of it this way. In most instantly, you are an individual being. OK, you're uh, the uh, first dimension is that you are an individual creature. We have divided the world. Literally, we, if the world was a cake, we have cut it up into pieces. Keep this into mind. Keep this in mind in regards to your intelligence when wondering about it. The second factor comes to the fact that we are conscious, <clears throat> that the fact that and these are in no specific order. I'm just sharing these points that our eyes are open this is why the argument that there is something over nothing can be made because we are that something in the nothing that is here you know our our consciousness is the proof of our existence is it not it's a discussion over how much you are creating the world and how much the world is creating you. When you go towards religious or spiritual, I'll put those both in the same category in this specific context of what I'm saying, <clears throat> because they take you towards the unknown. They make your, they take some part of your attention to the unknown. Religion takes a certain percentage of your attention and makes it beyond the unknown. Mystics dive into the unknown. <clears throat> this is why the spiritualists you know, knocked on the house, door of the house, on the house of the scientist, the mystic, and the scientist said, get out of here, man, and the spiritualist left, and the spiritualist had knocked on the door of the religious person, and the religious person came and said, blasphemy, get out of here, man, <laughs> and so we begin to see it is, it is any time, think of it this way, the healthy way to be alive is that 50% of your world is known to you, and 50% is unknown, now, the intellect, the scientific approach, I'll get to the third dimension soon of what I was saying, but this is so important. <clears throat> there is a deviation from intellectual correctness which is a strange deviation that happens in the mystical process because you have to begin trusting how you're a collective being which goes uh, to the third dimension. So <clears throat> what I'm saying, okay, let me sum up because I'm, I'm drawing too big of a picture that I may not be able to complete it. creature has appeared or let me say it like this eyes have opened a creature is found in a world as this creature finds others it finds its collective self 
We are kind of like intelligent raindrops trying to merge. I am telling you, the future has nowhere else to go aside from being a collective, unconscious, uh, and, uh, and uh, a collective, unconscious, unknown. It's gonna. It's not gonna be comprehensible. We are evolving to a state of intelligence where the dimensions of our experience transcend the dimensions of our languages. This is why I'm saying I've created a word for this because I feel I'm the first one on the top of the hill, maybe <coughs> in 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 this era at least. So <laughs> ah, hidden egos. Egos are like ninjas. They come out of the shadow. <laughs> <laughs> That's so silly. <coughs> so what I'm trying to say is that how we define ourselves now will suggest realistically what can happen. So spirituality we should uh, mr within's approach is forget all ideology first realize you're a thought then consciously pick back all the ideas of your life you see some people think the <clears throat> uh the kind of supreme enlightenment of the zen tradition and the yogic tradition is a sort of state where you have pretty much reached the heavens okay where you are in some sense uh no longer uh, uh, the, the creation, you're no longer the object and subject of the moment that's moving, you are the witness. I don't know how to tell this, but you're, the witness is your true presence and it's attributeless. Like literally there are ancient books that are telling us that our consciousness is like a glass orb moving through colored surfaces. The Yoga Patanjali Sutras say such a thing. And it's incredible because I find it to be very true. I, we can identify with any content in the moment. It's as if I'm looking at my physical body and I say, yo, this is my body, it's alive, yay. But I could look at any phenomena and I could impose life in it in the same way I am self-imposing identity into the moment. You see what I mean? Eventually it comes to an action. That means our, the cause of one dimension becomes the effect of another. It is kind of like the double mirrors or the portal dynamic of reality, where eventually you step out of one room of how the universe was conceived to be static, and you move into a new room where the universe is being defined by its dynamism. That means you're not being defined by who you were, you're being defined by what you do now. Do you see what I mean? How you look at it now. So these three dimensions of the individual, of the conscious, uh, <coughs> uh, the individual, the conscious, what was the third one, Jesus? Objective, there we go. The individual, objective, conscious being. What that means is the edge of the veil of thought is very visible. Let me tell you a hilarious way where you can update anything. It's incredible when you realize this. <clears throat> it's like a tool of the mind. Any phenomena you see, you will notice that it is language that orchestrates its relationship with other phenomena. So for example, when I see two objects, if we were looking at life on an atomic level, it's as if it's, it's like we're all the same, made of the same stuff, in some sense, you know? There's, there's, there's oxygen in all our lungs. So what I'm saying is like, we, we are naturally kind of the same, made in the same space of uh, reality. Our eyes have opened uh, in this universal sector. <clears throat> but now we are moving beyond trying to just satisfy the individual life. The individual will wonder about the collective. And let me tell you, I think this is like, uh, how can I tell you, like the, the best example of evidence of this, you know, 
how, uh, is that in some sense the most richest people they attain a level of wealth where they're like okay what is this costume games i'm just holding uh, an account with lots of numbers in it you know <laughs> so what i'm saying is it eventually comes down to collectivity you're not just defined by what you do you are defined by how your species moves do you see the difference it's as if do you want the eyes of the people on this planet to open more to the clarity of what is here <clears throat> or do we want to devolve and go back into the cave every generation has its own war and I, when i'm saying war it means there is challenges of the reality which you can't do anything about what that means is you see a building you can't go push the building you have to push your objection to it away <clears throat> so it's a sense of kind of imposing and then uh, retrieving. You see, the mind is moving that way. It is projecting, learning, watching its projection, then projecting again. Watching its projection and projecting again. <clears throat> and as it does this at very fast speed, like if literally somebody began reading really fast to you, really fast, and you could somehow hear what every word they were saying your mind could only catch up with what they were saying is if it was making a movie behind your eyes so i'll tell you this imagine i say uh imagine a red apple and a green apple hovering around each other in a circular way in the air so that's something that the word evoked the sound brought an atmosphere where a, so, uh, the, a quality of our free will imposed that phenomenon. <clears throat> you see, it's like your choice has to do with your definition. Human beings, the less they know, the more natural they are. The more they know, the less they feel nature needs to do the work. And so you forget your roots and the tree slowly begins to tilt. I believe what the world needs is a permission to use a new brush to redesign reality. I think before we become believers and disbelievers, we should look at life as designers. A designer, imagine whether it's an architect or an artist or whatever, anyone who's working with certain designs, uh, geometry or whatnot. You'll begin to see it's as if you can't, it's like, is, is a square good or evil? You know, if, if you ask somebody, is a circle good or evil? It's like, no, no, people are like, yo, man, it's a shape. It doesn't have personality. What are you saying? It's good or evil, right? So I'm telling you, that's the level we should start with. A level where there cannot be allegiance to a certain part of the wheel of karma, this dualism that's going around. <clears throat> It's like, it's like something in the cosmos is selling dualism to an eternal soul, you know? <laughs> you see, there, were, there are kind, different kinds of, uh, I find, uh, interpretations of divinity. <clears throat> it's kind of like this. Based on the universal principle axiom the person has, that means every person has this sort of philosophy. It's like life, if it has a value for you now, it had to, the complex arrives from the simple, you know? And what that means is that means you are not just who you are now, you are a progression of development. You are a certain conscious being. You see, it's like spirituality doesn't have to be stories of, you know, Casper or whatever. Like spirituality is, is, is just a sound we make when we notice there is something more beyond the sensory perception. It is literally like, imagine, like, 
uh, caveman discovering fire and freaking out, okay? Somebody noticing something beyond what they consider is beyond their sensory perception. It becomes, they become like that kind of caveman freaking out. And that becomes, that's how the word spirituality in some sense has been kept alive. But it, what it is, is that nature is dancing in a certain way. And our eyes have opened as a certain uh, position in this dance. That means humanity can't do much. On some level, it's, we can't go save everything. You see, it's like after we have solved the basic human problems globally, we're all going to chill out and uh, create a sort of uh, efficient, utopic atmosphere. You know, it, it doesn't mean we forget chaos. Chaos is important. You see, it's as if um, I have this theory that if, if you see chaos, there are two forces that can break that chaos. Any chaotic phenomena, let's say any chaotic force and of course this has to do with again my idea of that every for every per personality ar arises steps out of uh, uh, this sort of philosophical perspective of the first way the world was kept <clears throat> like let me let me oh man <laughs> too many thoughts intersecting at the same time I am saying that when you really just sit still and silent for 10 to 20 minutes wherever you are at least once a day and you do nothing except watch and at most listen to your breathing. That means like I've had moments where I've, I've panicked and I've, I have asthma too and so I've, I've had these, these, these moments where I've had this sort of emotional panic intersecting with a sort of biological asthma attack right <clears throat> and it was after like a night of long drinking you know <laughs> this is years ago you know i know i'm not fond of uh uh alcohol you know but what i'm trying to say is that in that moment there was so much pressure on how I felt I was being uh, identifying and being identified in the moment that there was a collapse. We don't, we might not realize it, but human beings are not just eternal powerhouses of energy. Even though when life becomes important enough, energy, you suddenly get energetic. But what I'm saying is that after a certain level of pressure and suffering, hope dies. I'm not joking. Hope is like, shit, I can't do anything anymore. You're suffering too much as a creature and you're believing you're suffering. So what, how you, it's as if your prayers never reach God's ears when you are lying to yourself, you see? So what it is, is that we have to study our subjective lives. And that's my intention. I, I, I just see the whole thing with this Mr. Within channel. I'm like, okay, we are human beings. There's a known factor, an unknown factor to the moment. The unknown factor seems to suggest that if there is a truth beyond all this, a higher dimension of sorts, in some sense, that what the knowledge of this dimension will be bowing to the superior. What that means is what if this universe of ours has a sort of onion style multidimensionality, well, guess what? It's like <clears throat> we are kept in the greater sight of the intelligence of truth, you know, or the truth of intelligence, better yet, how, how there is a lens of authorization for objective and subjective harmony. It's think of it this way. Think of it this way that if, if Mr. Within is saying you have an objective self and a subjective self in the moment, uh, the objective self, its intention is to survive. So it's trying to survive in the fittest physical way, whatever that is to it. And then the subjective self also is very important because it is not just responsible for its survival. It is also responsible for the objective survival as well. Your mind has the burden of taking care of itself and 
you know, the body. Your mind is like the older, bro older brother of your body, you know. I find the mind to be like an instrument. An instrument that every moment the unique thought is like a certain sound that is arising from it. And our task in this life is to figure out what we are fundamentally. Because if we don't know what we are, we are the unconscious program of nature. That means it made no difference the fact that we opened our eyes as creatures. The fact that we stepped out of the cave, the fact that we built civilization, it would make no difference if we still act unconsciously. And so the conscious mind is very crucial to study. The conscious mind is uh, how you have to accept prior to you how you think you're a person, you're just the moment being here. It's so instantaneous and simple and just due to its instantaneous presence, there's an absence of any thought. It's like, you don't need to even think, you know it instantaneously that you're here. You're alive and here, right? So the knowing is instantaneous. Now in the higher levels of yogic practice, uh, there has to be an opening up of the intuition. The intuition is the intelligence of your heart that is caged. And from the cage, it is calling to the mind. Think of it. And what the heart is, is with the care. So right now, uh, imagine like how the difference between if how you would be in front of someone you hated and how you would behave in front of someone you loved, you really loved. Do you just, just take that into consideration, how you would ap approach a chaotic moment or how would you uh, approach <clears throat> uh, an ordered moment and in some sense, how would they approach you? When chaos comes, you point to the order. If the op chaos doesn't hear the order, you must create a superior chaotic mirror. That means... Um, Your, your inner vision <clears throat> is your intelligence. And your inner intelligence is, is being storified. We take it for granted how language is such a delicate technology. You know? Let me tell you how delicate and hilarious language is. Imagine a moment where a person through an Abrahamic context has went to heaven and is, has died and resurrected and in some sense uh, gone to a moment of judgment. And they're telling the man, why should we let you in heaven? And the man begins to speak. And he says, because I did this and that and this and that and this and that, right? <clears throat> and then it's as if in that moment, the artificialness a phenomena, it breaks. You're, it, you can, liars, uh, let me tell you something fascinating. Liars are protected in the dark until the spotlight finds them and then fear arrives. Anytime you go against your true nature as a being, as a natural evolved being, there's resistance. And that resistance is AKA karma. <laughs> You must find the eyes beyond uh, stories and in some sense, as you move beyond the la linguistic simulation, you, you are reintroduced to the value of your direct experience in accordance to the unknown happening first. Because I'm telling you guys, here's the thing, we've put the world in a box of our own creation and then anything in society which is a tool to get us outside of that, this box, we worship and think it's divine. 
Do you know what that means? That means we are the same way we used to idol worship. We are worshiping language. We're worshiping subjective phenomena. I am telling you every human being right now is worshiping thought because they think they are thoughts. And of course, on paper, you are a thought. Enduring speech, you are a thought. But when you are still in silent prior, imagine before you learned language and spoke, what were you? What eyes were here? What was that intelligence here? And so Lao Tzu noticed this. And in some sense to Lao Tzu, who was uh, Confucius's teacher, he realized the value of action through inaction. How there is something beyond our eyes and that is why we live to see it. And so pretty much people have to wonder what their civil, if their civilization was their kid, what, what is this kid uh, asking itself? I mean, I, I find it, it's ridiculous. Don't you find it ridiculous? We have incredible nationalistic values, patriotism going on. But we, we don't, that patriotism is, sub, is subjective. I'm telling you, language is like fire. It was created. Man sparked it up. There are moments where there's this ancient saying that says, don't chase the butterfly. Sit still and silent in the garden of paradise and the butterfly of clarity will land on your forehead. What that means is you are in a life, which means you are in a game. And what does the character do in the game? Well, it can study the setting. It can study the character. You know, it can study everything and eventually come to the realization that the known is the simulation of the unknown. That means science, uh, in some sense, has taken the steering wheel of the attention of civilization. But it has come to realize that if the language doesn't evolve, the scientific experiment's value is reduced. You see, look at how fascinating it is. Life is so multidimensional on some level. When you look at history, every person's life is like their own universe contributing to the major one. It's like in music, you know, there's a... Uh, imagine universe minor and universe major. <laughs> We bringing octaves into this, you know, model. I find that at the end of the day, that moment where every person's going in bed to sleep, and literally they are just on their bed in darkness, waiting to fall asleep. In that moment. You are not a liar. It's like it doesn't matter if you're a liar right before your eyes close. It's as if the structures of thought that kept your behaviors will shake. That means just the fact that the creature notices the process of death, the in internal personalities have died. Many memories have dispatched. And so what it is, is the way I see is it's that every day I wake up and I... Uh, it's, it's as if I clear the table and I put new phenomena, new attention points, new, new, new viewpoints uh, on this table, okay? And then at the end of the day, I pa repack all these tools, put it in the bag, and then you return to the unconscious. So we are travelers in the conscious state. This is the unique uh, mindset I want to share. 
that it's like rather than us thinking reality is consciousness what if re our consciousness is the unconscious of another consciousness you know <laughs> what i'm saying is a sort of a uh, symmetrical dualism at work That means imagine right now, if you think you're a good person in a parallel reality, the worst version of you is walking too. Now imagine if you're a bad person in a parallel reality, the best version of you is walking through, wa uh, walking, you know? And so you kind of see which one is real. As if when it comes to the analysis of psychology, we are actually taking images from, uh, allocated from one moment and smashing it to another image allocated from another moment. And that's kind of like how your mind is a river of various thought streams, streams of consciousness, streams of various moments in life you've been conscious, phenomena has been in some sense uh, kind of experientially documented in, in, and sculpted in, uh, into the art, uh, you know, your archetypal structure. Believe it or not, behind our eyes there's a city. But you don't enter it as a human being. It, it doesn't have to do with any personal. It's like, think of it this way, instead of human being, we could have called ourselves anything else. We chose that word. And now that word has value. That word where, in, like we see... You know, when, when, when the great leaders of mankind through history have said, for humanity, they've shouted. In that moment, everybody cheers. Every, everybody celebrates that name and sound and symbol. Okay? So what I'm saying, that name and sound and symbol could be any other name and sound and symbol. So it is, again, the dance of subjective imposition into objective phenomena. And this is very fascinating to just study because when you come to study your mind, it, it's uh, certain aspects of it I recommend people to write. Literally buy a notebook and anything you experience in this life, write it down. Try to see how your mind articulates what happens to you. <clears throat> it has to do also with peace. I don't know how to say this. I mean, we can't, we can't avoid in this life process uh, without acknowledging the concept of peace. One can say one, one only suffers when they know there is something better. If you don't know there is something better, the suffering is even pointless. So the more empty the universe is, it's like, why does it matter like, if, that we suffer? Even it, It's like this kind of nihilistic depression, right? I kind of find myself playfully wondering about the archetype of the ambassador of the unknown. You see, there was, there was a kind of, I feel all the prophets in reality, uh, in our history, who have received some sort of revelatory experience through some sort of archangel or whatever, It was a moment <clears throat> where the mind of the individual reached the edge of its own reality and then there came a realization of the beyond. When you notice the beyond, something humble happens, just a wave of humbleness hits you. <laughs> because you see how vast this cosmic structure is. And I don't know how to say it. You just, it, it it's like, you know, it, it, it's like, how do you, how do you, how do you, the tree when it is ready gives fruit. You can't, because you're, because you're a natural being, you can't really reverse engineer all these people who are saying law of attraction and all this. It's like, um, I think a lot of it is um, just idea worship. You're just worshiping a different concept. You know, 
<laughs> I find that, of course, I mean, it, it is, it is kind of possible that human beings are, are, are what we consider to be our minds are actually waves as if the brain is generating waves and because it's generating waves, it's conscious that it's a wave. So it's as if we are conscious that physical phenomena is leading to subjective phenomena somehow. That consciousness is in a triangular relationship. That means I've, I've spoken of the simultaneity of dualities a lot, but I've not uh, often spoken about the simultaneity of, I don't know what you would call it, it's um, uh, of a sort of uh, simultaneity, simultaneous trio. Okay, three dimensions are present at once. So it's very easy to kind of see, like first imagine singular dimension, it's just atoms here, singular. You can't get more singular than atoms, you know? It's just atoms here and it, all humanity on that level is just the hallucination of atomic behavior, you know? <clears throat> then, from the singular, we went to the dual. We saw good and bad. We saw night and day. We saw the known and the unknown. So again, the simultaneity of the chicken and the egg. <laughs> the known and the unknown at the same time. Okay? <laughs> so we went from singular into first an illusion of duality, then into the truth of duality, which is the simultaneity of, with the singular. So what that means is it's kind of like singular dimension. It's like achievement unlocked. <laughs> you're, you experience the singular dimension, achievement unlocked. Then you went to the dualistic mindset, the morality spectrum, the, uh, as some people have said, the moral landscape, you know, as Sam Harris says, you know. Uh, so, so what I'm trying to say is after you have observed and studied the, the simultaneity of duality, then it becomes the simultaneity of three dimensions at the same time, again, the trial. And so from this triangular model, what occurs is you realize what you have kept separate from you can also be in the moment seen as equal to you. That means just the fact that our behavior changes means that every moment we speak, we are a different self. Kind of like how Heraclitus would say, no man steps in the same river twice. And it is not the same man, and it is not the same river. Literally every moment is like new moment, new moment, new moment. But something remains. Something remembers thought as it moves throughout our attention. You see, it's like you have to build a sort of ability to be free internally. It doesn't matter how much external freedom you get if internally you don't care about the value of, of how you have set into motion certain beliefs and ideology. This is why I'm saying, even though I'm speaking right now, but my, my, my principal view is that we can never be thoughts. Because the fact that a thought is thinking, it's a thought, and that's a fact, like it's, it's void, it's empty. Of course, these are from the unique f philosophical view, viewpoint I'm considering it, you know. Uh, I consider these Mr. Within Talks to also be a sort of digital notepad for ideas I feel worthy of sharing. You gotta love the world. Because if you don't, you miss out. That's simply it. You gotta care for humanity. You gotta realize everybody can have a better day. You gotta realize honesty is the warrior. No longer being a warrior in today's society is being powerful and violent and savage and strong. That is no warrior, that is a fool. In today's society, the, counter, the strength of the warriors of the counterculture they are realizing the value that because you are living every day once and you have one lifetime in this form, live honestly. That, that, that realization is a sort of karmic freedom. I'm not joking. 
because it is you don't understand how much like like physically certain pressures arise throughout the day and then these pressures translate into internal uh, needs for reclarification so in, in a certain moment where I've had a boring day like a, a slow day I've been on the subway and, and to me like subways are uh, in some sense a, a tragedy you know it's like you're, every day you're you imagine somebody going to work every day on a subway that person's brain every day is moving at that speed in a certain direction the warriors of this counterculture realize that we have to find an honest world to live in or we won't care for our findings you know if you don't really have any vision imposed into objective phenomena you have no reason to move and the thing is when you are a child you have every reason it's your energetic existence that is being the reasoning of your movement it's as if you're an energetic uh, you know uh, child and just running around and playing or whatever remember your childhood right now and so what that means is that your intelligence was orchestrated to, with net natural energetic expression, but as you adopted to certain patterns of behavior, the mind had to, in some sense, create a separation. That means we fragmented the psyche of nature by building civilization. And so this is why we will forever be in this thing where we are the conscious mind of nature and the unconscious is the chaos, you know? Because we have chosen to stand up, all those who sit down are, are staring down on us. They're staring down at us. The rarest thing in this world is to care for the mind of your species. For, for the mind of nature. It's weird, but it's like when we have to return to nature, but it doesn't mean we got to go like live in the trees or whatever. It just means we have to realize why the trees were there, what relationship our ancestors had with the world around them and how much the world is like. It's like, let me tell you, it's hilarious. Our ancestors, you know how they are looking at the future generations, you know, they're looking at it as if they created a prison and they stepped in this prison. Our ancestors who, were, who had a sort of unique relationship and reverence for nature, if, if their eyes, you know, uh, from the skies could gaze upon us, it would be in, in some sense a situation where we have put ourselves in a box and we are, we are entertaining ourselves with a culture that thinks outside the box. Like, it's like, great, but no, the whole structure is a flaw. The vision is too dynamic. It's like you can't explain, you know, a backflip to someone. The guy has to experience it to truly understand what it is. And that's what I'm saying. Sometimes so if you get ideologically convinced, uh, you, 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 it's as if you're denying listening to your intuition. And to be honest, I don't. I consider spirituality just any sort of spiritual tradition. You know, on this planet and in our history, I consider them to be backup warnings, backups, backup programs. Literally, the culture reached an inefficiency where it was avoiding the unknown, and so the the, the spiritual counterculture to that was, in some sense, the the uh, bringing back the position of the unknown.
soul and external life, once well maintained, leads to an internal life, and once well, well maintained, leads to the presence of the moment. The presence of the moment, really, you can't have thoughts about. It's so instantaneous that it's just awareness. It's awareness as space. So the same relationship that space has to matter, your consciousness has with subjectivity. The rawness of attention as form has appeared, phenomena is here. The man who looked at the atom and realized we were in one. The vastness of the unknown. There's this incredible, uh, you know, quote, uh, not quote, this story about Diogenes. And Diogenes is this Greek philosopher. And this Greek philosopher was lying down on this Greek uh, grassland. He was, he's known in philosophy, to some philosophers as the father of cynicism. And so Diogenes, this wise and like next level philosopher, is just lying down on the grass, like just enjoying the sun. And suddenly he hears footsteps coming, but he's still in, he just lying there enjoying the sun. Then he suddenly noticed suddenly the head of someone come and block the sun and so in that moment he kind of raises his head and he looks and he sees it's alexander the great this is a real story guys i'm not this is a this is this has historic value listen and so the thing is uh what happens is that alexander the great is there with his entourage and his men and what it, all, all you know the whole crowd of whoever was there and Diogenes is just there lying on the grass with all these people there and alexander the great looks at Diogenes and just look at how this emperor is speaking that means in the from, from alexander the great's em viewpoint he's being super nice to Diogenes. okay <laughs> He, you know, so so what happens is Alexander the Great looks at Diogenes and says, and says, what does the great Diogenes ask of the great Alexander? You know, Diogenes looks at Alexander the Great and says, stay out of my son. <laughs> says something like, don't block my son. And just stares at Alexander the Great as if like, think about it, buddy, think about it. And Alexander the Great suddenly thinks about it and he's like, don't block my son. And he realized, wow, Diogenes is indirectly telling him, don't let your authority as the emperor try to impinge upon my freedom. As if he, he said that with that sentence, with, the, with that poetic intention, he revealed that in the mind of Alexander. And Alexander the Great looks at his entourage. And his entourage, after dark, and he said, don't block my son. They were all like, oh shit, oh my god, oh my god, dog, he's just said that to Alexander the Great, oh my god. You know? <laughs> And so, Alexander the Great looks at his men and looks at Diogenes after understanding with that one word what teaching Diogenes gave him. And he looks at his men and he says, if I was not the great Alexander, I would be Diogenes the Great. I would be the great Diogenes. That means Alexander the Great is looking at all his men and he's saying, if I was not me, I would be this guy. And now look at what that guy's...
Okay, <clears throat> um, this is the picture of the story I was telling you, which I'm going to finish right now for you, and then I got to end off. I feel I'm in a, uh, reaching the end of the night, you know? Uh, let me see, where is the thing? Alexander und Diogenes by Lovis Corinth, 1894-1894. So you see this artwork is the story I'm telling you. So imagine the story I'm telling you is literally happening in this. And let me actually make the artwork big. Uh, and then after the story finishes. There we go. <clears throat> Alexander the Great says, If I was not the great Alexander, I would be the great Diogenes. And in that moment, as all of uh, Alexander's the men are looking at him honorably, in that moment, Diogenes says, if I was not Diogenes, I would be Diogenes. And it was such an intense and deep statement. In some sense, he revealed to Alexander the Great that he is not his thought. He is not his ego. He is not his idea. There is something more alive than that here. Something beyond the conceptual domain. Every human mind an opportunity to study the unknown and share it. To, it's no longer the tribe needs to go hunt and gather food. It's like now we need to hunt and gather the greatest ideas that are humanity's last refuge. Literally, we have to at least create a network where the future generations, if they do see a solution, those solutions can hit quickly the global stage. So we want to begin to develop. It's as if it's so hard to trying to change the past that you're like, all right, past, you be you, you know, and you, you invoke a new future. You envision one. Sometimes life brings an experience where your attention will go a lot on that experience and in paying more attention to anything, you will unravel new dimensions to it. That's just how it works. Imagine your attention is like Cyclops from the X-Men, right? That laser beam hits anything you pay attention to, right? So similarly, whatever you pay attention to, the conscious mind is constantly as if like a hammer every time hitting the unconscious. So it's as if in every experiential, like something that really, um, you'll know it, you'll know it. It's like an adrenaline rush happens when there is more than like 60% unknown in your moment. Like you literally feel like the, the free will has to uh, expressively maintain itself. You know, you can't be a person if you don't have a body. Do you see? So the personality's purpose is to maintain the body. But it is not just to maintain the body, but to live a life where once the harmony of the subjective and the objective have become one and the same, it's this kind of ancient esoteric idea of the human being uh, awaiting uh, the return to the universal will through the authorization of the universal will.
It's kind of like before we create virtual reality technologies. Language is a sort of simulation. Once that simulation stops, experience remains. Experience tends to be attributeless, so the unknown moves it. When the unknown moves it, you realize the freedom of the psychological perspective that outside any box, there is no box. That means outside any belief, there never needed to be that belief. Beyond the limits of uh, how the thought acts as a room to put the whole universe in, it's the opposite. You know, thoughts are trying to be the world. And our species is suffering because of it. And so stress and depression can only be helped and in some sense solved with service. This was the hidden secret that you can't just do nothing and expect something to happen. There has to be some sort of honest living done. And so there were certain ancient people in Vedic culture known as rishis and yogis. And I am very fond of these people. They are like, to me, like, as, as fascinating as the pyramids of Egypt. There is a mystery about how the psychology uh, lets go of how it is a form. And in the formlessness of being realized, the cause and effect are one door. Our eyes open, our eyes close. We are kind of like constantly editing reality and... Uh, putting clips back into it, you know, our, sometimes when I'm walking on the street and I remember something that happened to me years ago, that thought has now been active in the present moment, it has gained life. My attention gives life to my subjective reality. And if my attention gives life to my subjective reality, and my body is moving towards surviving through getting what the subjective reality wants, it, it seems like the body is following the mind's desire. The body is objective. The mind at most can be subjectively contained by us through the technology of language. However, beyond that, it has to do with the world moving. So at some point we realize we should stop searching because our attempt to search is a, is an is like uh we have to wait we have to wait for life to take the first step kind of in chess you know how one one player takes the first step takes uh moves the first piece so in some sense i want you to imagine that you're waiting for life to make its move and from how it has moved it is in some sense a communication any moment the the shamans were kind of wise they were they had a access to a unique wit let me tell you why because they saw the voice of the logos as the spirit of their ancestors and so what that means is they could trust the voice of the unknown through their past the past became a portal to the unknown for most people, the, like as Papaji says, the mind is a graveyard. The past is a graveyard. And people were like, holy shit, the past is a graveyard. And, and they're like, what do you mean, Papaji? And Papaji was like, literally, bro, like, <laughs> of course, I'm paraphrasing in my own way. <laughs> but Papaji was like, literally, everything in your past is, it's done. It's lived its life and it's gone. So you are left in the present moment always. And we have to make sure the ego doesn't block our sun. It's like people started worshipping in the moon and the moon was like, guys, don't worship me, it's the sun's light. <laughs> and people were like, you're so honest, moon, you know, and they still worship the moon. <laughs> Life has to be invoked into meaning. And so there must eventually be a narrative if you want to be a, a person, you know. And I don't know if I'm doing a good thing per se by trying to wonder about the complexities of how psychology uh, is valuable. It's as if I've kind of saw in what Carl Jung did and I realized the freedom of the Western mind. 
to not identify but still wonder about the identifier you know to to process the data and still wonder about how the sequencing of the phenomena arrived and eventually you will see that it's either a greater dimension that's uh, incomprehensible now but will be comprehensible later or it is incomprehensible that's it it's as if there is a ladder or there isn't you know if there is a ladder then there's greater dimensions to our reality if there isn't a ladder then it's like it's like you know let us be free as one humanity. <laughs> oh my God. <sighs> Matsuyo Basho, the Zen master says, the journey itself is my home. Literally suggesting that if you are suffering because of something you used to have or you want to have, then you are not being the journeyer. You're just focusing on the destination or your starting point. And that can, can help you. You know, sometimes remembering your past gives you strength. But, you know, in modern times, it seems to be causing depression. I don't know. It's the task of every conscious being to, to study their intelligence. And eventually they'll find their eyes, you know the eyes of the species uh, very poetically I would say uh, Swami Krishnananda this man they asked him what is religion and he was like God remembering himself and the guy was like whoa and what that means is like the purpose of life was never for a personality the personality is temporary as long as it identifies with the transitioning subject or the objective phenomena. So what that means is if we are, you are, you are like hovering in change, as if change is the projector light that is showing who we are, you know, as a creature. You know, so it's this changing force. This is why I like how Buddhism so brought forth the idea of karma as a wheel. The wheel of karma, something that has a design is spinning, but what you will notice as a wheel is that the center of the wheel doesn't move. And the less you are active, the less there is a shape to be related, you know? There is a presence of how everything in your moment is a field of intelligence. I don't know how to emphasize this. I know it's a strange concept. We thought it was just computers that connected to fields of, you know, like one, like one wave could be attained by many, many ports. But it, what I'm saying, it's... It, there will come a day where humanity will wonder as much as the, it's wondering about the stars in front of its eyes, it will wonder about the, the meaning of the stars behind its eyes. And that day is an important day. It is the liberating moment where you realize the power of your free will is to choose. And any moment, you got to be careful because they say habit leads to the decay of the mind. Any moment you do something unauthentic or against your nature where you just automatically feel bad about something, that feeling can endlessly remain unless you wonder why the behavior was there. Somebody said that if you, a person who lies is like creating various parallel realities of themselves to others, you see? That person, <laughs> I don't know, it was one of these ancient Greek dudes who said it. But uh, <laughs> after we have wondered about the world we live in, we will truly wonder about the world that lives in us, and that world that lives in us is the journey towards making the unconscious conscious. That is so key. That means there's, you, you are a program of nature that has attained certain moments of consciousness. In those moments, uh, uh, just really watch how self-awareness is occurring. 
and you'll see the separation between the self and the awareness is consciousness and matter and eventually once the, it's concluded that they're being in an unknown way witness simultaneously that unknown simultaneous witness it liberates itself from the egoic construct and that's when a passenger on a hidden train of thought will arrive at why it had to hide why the thought was there you will return to your source because you cannot ignore the call of your cause i'm not joking we are we are such unique creatures we have similar designs yet our eyes open up to different views our freedom the freedom of humanity and i feel this is a very common sense way of thinking about it that in the future our the success of the civilization depends on how many of these unique viewpoints from the minds of people are shared in a global in a global stage where suddenly the thought structure has value do you know how many great ideas are passing by and nobody's catching them there seldom do they say but genius occurs only when there is endless effort that's it anything you put endless effort in you will automatically during time attain mastery it's like hilarious just just if you do one thing you gain comfort you begin cultivating various experiential modes of it because i think it's better being an uh, an honest uh and it's better to be an honest sinner than a dishonest saint the dishonest saint is breaking itself literally the it's as if a person who's taken a wrong direction because every generation requires its own archetypes that's the freedom of it oh, it's like we weren't born to do the same stuff they used to do in the past if we were born to do the same stuff they did in the past we would be the past we any idea from ancient times that overrides the potential for a modern and new idea entering your mind is in some sense uh a moment of masking your face from the eyes of the world there is so many internal separations it's just fascinating to conceptualize and i'll tell you how easy it is right now if i were to tell you imagine literally uh just the outline of a cube that is made of beams of light imagine like star wars lightsaber okay so imagine this golden kind of cubic outline inside it it's empty it's only the lines of the cube and so the lines of the cube and so imagine this cube just hovering in the air glowing golden now imagine this cube spinning it's starting to slowly spin then it starts to spin faster and then it speeds it spins so fast that you cannot see its shape so if you were able to visualize what i just said you can experience the same thing through speech but you sp you experience it through a sort of rhythmic abundance at, at the same time it's it's more like an e a remembrance of nature that is the a sort of evocation or rebellion against the ancient archetypes that are trying to rule the modern mind you see there's something beautiful about nature I, I believe it was Charlie Chaplin who said like this intense statement it's like as long as human human beings die uh, humanity or hope will never perish something like that and I was like damn Charlie Chaplin said this this was like heavy for me sometimes in the eyes of the world you can appear nothing as a fool nothing as you know other than a fool 
because it is very rare to want to uh, patiently observe and analyze. Very few people do this. Very few people dare to truly stare at life and see what's going on rather than living a life where they want to constantly see what they, it's like they want the world to listen to their mind rather than realizing they got to let their mind settle to see the true reflection of the world's mind. You know, that's what I'm saying. You, you come to a point of like the ultimate student was the void and the ultimate teacher was endless manifestations. Like what else do you want? <laughs> what else can the teacher teach and what else can the student learn? The stories of our life oscillate between nothing and everything. How, how poetic. <sighs> Thanks for tuning in, guys. Uh, I hope this was a useful episode. Much blessings and namaste.